Hello, my name is Dr. Paul Finger. I'm the director of the New York Eye Cancer Center and a specialist in ocular tumor, orbital disease, and ophthalmic radiation therapy. I wrote this lecture to share my experience with intravitreal injections. My patients say that they are happy with my methods and were pleased to know I intended to share them on this server. Since I first used intravitreal anti-VEGF agents for the treatment of radiation maculopathy and optic neuropathy, there has been quite an evolution of my intravitreal injection methods. This has been true for most injectionologists, for lack of a better term, in ophthalmology. Most of our methods are quite similar. However, two of my latest changes are worth highlighting in this lecture. For example, over the last two years, we have incorporated hypochlorous acid, or Avanova, betadine washout, into our pre-injection prophylaxis routine. However, let's start with definitions. Povidone iodine is also called betadine in its commercially available form. Hypochlorous acid is also called Avanova in its commercially available form. Below, you see my disclaimers. Clearly, povidone iodine or betadine is the most commonly used antimicrobial prophylaxis used prior to intravitreal injection. It has become the gold standard to prevent endophthalmitis. This is due to its wide acceptance in ophthalmic surgery its wide antimicrobial coverage, and its short onset of action. However, many patients develop allergic reactions and keratoconjunctivitis, causing significant discomfort following administration. These irritations and allergic reactions have led Ferguson, Scott, and McGavigan to compare a reduction of the 5% povidone iodine solution to a 1% povidone iodine solution for preoperative cataract surgery. Others have tried to improve patient comfort by washing out the povidone iodine after intravitreal injections have been completed. When performing an intravitreal injection, Typical povidone iodine prophylaxis involves placing two or three drops on the ocular surface and then waiting 60 seconds before performing the surgery. The question is, is there an alternative? Hypochlorous acid 0.1% has long been used as an antimicrobial in medical specialties like ear, nose, and throat, dermatology, and plastic surgery. Like povidone iodine, it offers a wide antimicrobial coverage and a short onset of action. Though clinical trials for intravitreal injection have not been completed, it has been widely used for blepharitis, eyelid inflammation, and demodex infection. I have found that unlike povidone iodine 5%, Avanova rarely causes discomfort during or after intravitreal injections. Hypochlorous acid is currently made around the world. Electrolysis is used to turn water, salt, and vinegar into two powerful disinfecting molecules hypochlorous acid, and sodium hydroxide. However, the commercially available form in ophthalmology, called Avanova, offers purified hypochlorous acid 0.01% and is pH balanced. It's very important for you to know that Avanova is purified by removal of the byproduct sodium hydroxide, and is also pH balanced to a range of 6.5 to 7.0. My antimicrobial prophylaxis technique is as follows. 
Seven minutes after installation of one drop of viscous lidocaine, two to three drops of betadine 5% are placed into the inferior fornix and allowed to cover the eye. Then I perform a betadine washout by spraying Avanova onto the ocular surface and eyelids. Then, after 60 seconds, I administer the intravitreal injection. It is important to note that unlike saline washouts, the hypochlorous acid washout is both antimicrobial and antiviral. I also use a special angled injection technique. I have found that the angled transcleral intravitreal injection more commonly seals and thus diminishes drug reflux. It closes a potential portal of entry for pathogens. It is the best way to make sure that all the prescribed amount of medication stays in the eye. In order to prove and demonstrate our observations, my fellow, Dr. Mittelmeda, and I performed a crossover study to prove that using angled injections resulted in more drugs staying in the eye. On your right is the graphic from that publication. We found that when angled injections were used versus perpendicular injections, the post-injection intraocular pressures were higher significantly higher. That is because more medication was being retained in the eye. Let's share a routine intravitreal injection performed at the New York Eye Cancer Center. As you're familiar, betadine is placed onto the inferior fornix. Blinking allows it to distribute over the ocular surface as well as time. I typically wait at least 30 seconds after the betadine to perform any additional manipulations. Next, I place a clean soft paper onto the mask to catch and protect the mask from the betadine-tinged antimicrobial fluid. Care is taken not to let the paper towel touch the eye or eyelids. Then I use the Avanova spray to wash out the betadine from the ocular surface. Here you see a comparison of the antimicrobial activity of povidone iodine 5% and hypochlorous acid 0.01%. Highlighted are the most implicated pathogens in endophthalmitis following vitriol injection. As you see, both medications offer fairly equivalent coverage. However, though both hypochlorous acid appears slightly better for select viruses, and cover SARS-19, it was found worse for Aspergillus niger. Years ago, in an effort to make my patients more comfortable at the New York Eye Cancer Center, we started using saline to wash out the betadine prophylaxis for intravitreal injection. This reduced patient discomfort. But we discussed with the patient that it also reduced betadine's post-injection antimicrobial effect. Now consider that unlike saline, 
using hypochlorous acid washout preserves that antimicrobial effect. You've seen from the prior slides that Avanova is effective against the SARS COVID-19 virus. At the New York Eye Cancer Center, we use it as pre-examination prophylaxis. We use it for intravitreal injections as an antimicrobial. We feel that it protects the physician administering eye care. It protects the patient from exposure from their providers and it also protects the patient from exposure to other patients in the office. At the New York Eye Cancer Center, we treat a lot of patients with radiation maculopathy and radiation optic neuropathy. These are predictable diseases based on measurements of radiation dose given to those structures at the time of initial treatment. On the top, slide you see a parafoveal choroidal melanoma. Its posterior location brings high levels of radiation close to and thus affecting the macula or optic nerve. Plaque location and dose to critical structures can be used to predict the location and severity of radiation vasculopathy. My observations over the last 35 years and recent publications on OCTA have shown that ocular radiation vasculopathy starts at the time of initial radiation. It continues as a subclinical disease until clinically apparent. It starts with vascular incompetence leading to edema. Later we see the more obvious signs such as cotton wool spots and retinal hemorrhages. Lastly, we see capillary dropout, neovascularization, and scarification. Like many diseases, for example, hypertension, diabetes, or heart disease, the damage is mostly irreversible. Therefore, early intervention offers the best chance for vision preservation. This graph shows that radiation-related vision loss occurred after an initial latent period of natural compensation. It also shows significantly significant evidence that patients treated with periodic continuous intravitreal anti-VEGF therapy were more likely to keep their vision. Here I'd like to share select cases. In this case we have a patient with anterior radiation optic neuropathy. He developed parapapillary cotton wool spots and hemorrhages as the first sign of his disease. He was 2032. After one year of periodic continuous intravitreal avastin, his vision returned to 2016. And on your right, with some pallor of the optic disc, his vision is maintained 5.3 years after initial treatment. I chose to present this second case because it was a subfoveal choroidal melanoma treated every four to six weeks with intravitreal avastin after the onset of early radiation maculopathy. Eight and a half years after continuous treatment, though there is some interretinal microangiopathy and capillary dropout, she maintains 20-25 vision. So in summary, Avanova washout of betadine 5% provided both improved patient comfort and an antimicrobial alternative to saline washout. Avanova covered most of the most common endophthalmitis pathogens associated with intravitreal injections and is effective against SARS COVID 19 in vitro. Angled intravitreal injections enhanced drug delivery and closed a potential portal of entry by providing self-sealing wounds. Early and continuous anti-VEGF suppression of radiation maculopathy and optic neuropathy will prevent or delay vision loss. Lastly, I'd like to give you these three links. My essential eye cancer podcasts include 
aspects of my 35 years experience in ophthalmic oncology here in the US. I also have a YouTube channel that includes some of my basic lectures more and more as time goes by and also a link to my website icancer.com which includes my outcomes. Uh, we are doing a project where we report our outcomes continuously on the internet as averages from the patients who return after treatment. I think you'll find all these links quite interesting and I'm open to questions should they arise. Thank you. I'd like to take a moment to thank the Eye Cancer Foundation for supporting our research and educational initiatives. We were the first to develop international multi-center cooperative research. We want to help you, your children, and families around the world. Please consider visiting our website, eyecancercure.com.